That's why I quit buying tickets to Carolina football because I know what the outcome is going to be. But <laughs> they're going to lose. Well, they did. They did. They did. I did find out uh, the other day they did have to call in the call in the terrorist America Homeland Security to a Carolina practice. Uh, they found a mysterious white powder on the field, and so they got the forensics out there checking and found out actually it was just a chalk for the goal line. <laughs> This week, and I happened to see WWJD. And I said, Oh, yeah, sure, what would Jesus do? And I looked, and that's not what it said. I also seen uh, 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 JDWW, that's, uh, or DJWW, Devil Just Won't Win, of course. But this WWJD was, What Would Jesus Drive? Of course, that took my oh. Oh, don't forget, everybody remember. I like, remember, I thought I forgot. Don't forget, we got to go talk to the ladies. have to talk to Sister Hazel after service the next week's homecoming. All right, ready? Why would Jesus drive? Now, everybody knows the, the old Acts chapter 2, and this, this is going to blow your mind. Ready? One theory is that Jesus would, would uh, tool around in old Plymouth because the Bible said God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden in a fury. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Fury 1, 2, and 3? Okay. I had a Fury 3 that didn't fly. All right. But in Psalm 83, the Almighty clearly owns a Pontiac and a Geo. The passage urges the Lord to pursue your enemies with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. I know, y'all. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Been a rough week, y'all. Here we go. Ready? Look. Perhaps God favors Dodge pickup trucks. Because Moses' followers are warned not to go up a mountain until the ram's horn sounds a long blast. <laughs> Y'all can go hoo, so that's okay. Just don't know what I'm preaching. <laughs> Some scholars insist that Jesus drove a Honda, but didn't like to talk about it. As proof, they cite a verse in St. John's Gospel where Christ tells the crowd, For I did not speak of my own accord. <laughs> Getting better. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Give me a little bit of break. A little bit. All right. I mean, I didn't fall over the seat laughing when I saw it. It was just cute. All right, ready? Here, I'm saving the best for last. But meanwhile, Moses rode an old British motorcycle as evidenced by a biblical passage declaring that the roar of Moses' triumph was heard in the hills. <laughs> and Joshua drove a sports car with a hole in his muffler. Joshua's triumph was heard throughout the land. <laughs> I had the 65 Mustang on that. And following the master's lead, the apostles carpooled in a Honda. The apostles were in one of court. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, there you go. That's right. Ain't got good. All, All the time. All the time. God right. is good. We're going to finish up from, from last week. And I'm going to try to go through it kind of fast. Uh, See if this thing will work here. There you go. Part two. You know, yesterday, of course, we're not going to go for homecoming. Uh, we've got a special speaker for homecoming. But uh, yesterday, I was riding down the road with my father-in-law. And my father-in-law just started talking about the Bible and talking about things. And while we were talking, he said, every, when I was a little boy, he said, every Sunday I got a chance to hear both sides. I said, okay, both sides. He said, yes. He said, I heard about heaven and hell. I said, that's good. He says, and he says, we don't hear a bunch about both sides of that. I said, well, I try to constantly talk about heaven and hell and Jesus and the blood. And it, it was a challenge to me. So uh, uh, in the next few Sundays, we're going to talk about what hell you want. There's too many of those around. I know. I try not to use that one, but you did it anyway. <laughs> okay. So we're going to see if you get, get your friends. I've talked about hell on multiple occasions, and, but, but uh, uh, this is going to be a series devoted to hell. Okay? So it's going to be a good thing, not a negative. It's going to be positive. You know, I don't like to sit, do these old gloomy spirit stuff. It's going to be positive. 
But over the next couple of weeks after homecoming, we're going to be talking about hell. So, again, and it's going to be what the hell you want. I don't want anything in hell, actually. Amen. But there's some things in hell that I need. There's some things in hell you need. Ready? Come and find out. There you go. There's some things in hell we all need. So you got to come and find out. All right? That's really that's all I'm saying. But it's really, really cool. All right, ready? Uh, five lessons from five smooth stones. Get your Bibles out in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 38. Stand for the reading of the word. Verse 38. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I talked about this one time before. You know, you hear people talk about hell and they'll say, and it drives me nuts. I get absolutely, I go bonkers when I hear this. They say, that's funny as hell. Hell's not funny. Or they say, it's cold as hell in here. No, it's not. Hell is hot. <laughs> and so that's what I say. Come on, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to, we're going to, going to be talking <laughs> after homecoming. We're going to talk about hell. Of course, it <laughs> might be a bad time, and after you eat, we're going to talk about hell. <laughs> All right. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put his helmet of brass upon his head, also he armed him with the coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, or tried to go, uh, uh, or decided he wasn't going to go because he said he hadn't proved it. I, I hadn't even tried this stuff in battle. He's getting ready to go to battle with a man who's wearing a sword and got a shield and got a spear, all of this stuff. And so Saul's trying to get him to be equal with his opponent. And he says, I've never even tried this stuff. I don't need this. I got something better. So David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these for I've not proved them. And David put them off and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in the script, and was and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that I'll come through with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I will come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give thee to the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day, and to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. <clears throat> And all the earth may know that there is a God. I want you to run it slower one time. It's just it's really, really awesome. He's got this giant that doubles him in size and, and quadruples him in experience as far as battles. And he looks at him and says, This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. I will smite you and take your head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistine. In other words, he says, After I get through with you, I'm going after the rest of y'all. Wow. That's powerful. After I get through with you, Goliath, I'm going to take the rest of them on. This is one little guy out there in the field without any armor, without anything on. He's going to stand there with a slingshot. He said, buddy, you're just the first one I'm coming at today. I'm coming at the rest of you too. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not the sword or the spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass... And the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David ran the other way. No. That David ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out this stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David, therefore David ran. Stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, drew out the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. 
I know, God, that you are alive and well. And, Father, there's nothing, God, beyond your, your capable eye to see and your capable hands to handle. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us, Lord, to help us see and to know and to understand that you are here and that something special is happening. We can't go by numbers. We can't judge by, by what we see. We have to judge by what we know. And that is that you never leave us or forsake us. And God, that something special is on the horizon. And God, something very powerful is getting ready to happen in our midst. We can't lose hope. We can't lose sight. We've got to hold on. In the name of Jesus, we love you. We praise your name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated on the way down. Tell somebody who passes behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us, and nothing shall be impossible. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, last week we started talking about this thing, and of course, uh, we talked about the story of David and Goliath, and we're going to take it from Goliath's viewpoint, but then we're going to morph it into our own experience. So we're going to talk about Goliath, how he saw the battle, and what caused him to lose but when we morph it into our own life and we begin to transform this story into our own experience, we'll find out that we do the same thing many times that Goliath did. And we'll find out if we're not careful, we'll find out with the same faith that Goliath had. And of course, uh, here's Goliath. I want y'all to kind of think about this thing. Here, here's Goliath. He's a big bad dude. Amen. This is just another day at the office for Goliath. And of course, real quickly from last week, Goliath means beheader. And of course, that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to touch our thoughts. He tries to touch our mind. He tries to steal our joy. He tries to get us constantly thinking in the wrong direction, thinking in a negative mindset. And of course, uh, he was the champion, the gap standard. That's the person that, uh, because the battles were so bloody, they had a champion one-on-one -on -one and winner take all. So Goliath was down there for 40 days or 40 nights. Nobody even wanted to hang with this guy and try to fight with him because they knew that this guy was a bad, bad dude. And so what he did was he actually had beheaded Israel without a fight. So of us in here today, you have been beheaded without even raising the sword. Wow. I'm going to let this sink in for just a minute. How many times have you accepted what Satan was selling without even trying to push it aside. How many times, my friend, I added something to our prayer, and this morning, Bethany said it with me. Uh, when, I, when I laid my hand, and her tumor on the outside is big as a fist, and so I laid my hand on that tumor after I have medicated it and put the stuff on it, the gauze on it, before I close it up with the other bandages, and I laid my hand on it, and I was praying, and I said, Lord, I curse this cancer by the root through the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. And here's the part I said, and Lord, we send this tumor back to hell from where it came from. Amen. You see, I told Beth, I said, do not accept. Do not accept defeat, dear. You stand and you hold on and you hold on all the way down. Matter of fact, I, I told her this too. I said, I, said, I, think, I think you're going to last a long, long time. We were joking, carrying on, and I was changing her manner. I said, I think we're going to last a long, long, you're going to last a long, long time. You're going to live to the ripe old age. I said, but just remember, if you get to heaven before I do, make sure you tell the big guy who changed all these bandages. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can get a little extra. <laughs> oh, she laughed. She just laughed. Okay. So I said, here we go. Then... After all this stuff, he met this little shepherd boy, and he was getting ready to show him just how big and bad a little boy can be with a little boy in God. Amen. Can you imagine? That's about how it looked. Can you imagine? Man, what was going on? So there's, there, there's five things here, five things that, that, that Goliath did that brought down his defeat by this little shepherd boy. And he's still using these five things, but today what he does is he takes these five things as he's the beheader and he gives these thoughts or lays these thoughts before us. It's our choice whether we pick them up or not. Okay? He lays the thoughts before us and he doesn't just lay them before us day and night. You go to bed thinking it. You 40 days and 40 nights, day and night. He, you wake up thinking it, you go to bed thinking it. This is exactly what Satan tries to do. And he knows if he does it enough that we'll take it as our own thinking. Because you know, a lot of times I want you to hear something carefully. There's times, please listen, don't misunderstand. 
There's times when Satan is talking in your mind. He's trying to feed something in your mind. And there's things that he's trying to throw at you. But when it comes out, listen carefully. It comes out in your own voice in your head. And because it comes out in your own voice in your head, you'll quickly accept it. So you've got to understand, don't listen to the voice. Instead, listen to the message. And when the message comes, know exactly if that's, listen, that's not what God said, and I don't have to stand for it. So, so, here we go. Number one, and I'm going to read through this quickly, it's from last week. Number one, he uh, judged the outcome by the size of his opponent. The Bible says he disdained them for he was only a youth. Matter of fact, Goliath was insulted. <coughs> Y'all are going to see this little bitty fella out here, this little inexperienced kid, snotty nose kid, to fight me, and so he laughs and he mocks. And so he's already determined that he's won. Huh. Let me ask you a question. And don't raise your hand. Do not point at anybody. In your mind, have you already determined that you lose? In your mind, have you already determined that you can't overcome this? In your mind, have you determined that there is no way out of what you're in? You've got to pay careful attention because, listen, this is what he did, what Goliath did against David, but at the same time, it brings down people every day. Again, don't who despises their small things, uh, small beginnings. Goliath did, Goliath died. Even like today, I walk in here and I look out. I've looked out of here before and seen this place packed. I've looked out of here before and it's not packed. Then we go through cycles. There's some cycles where you just can't find a place to sit. There's other cycles where, where, where you can find any place to sit. Amen. And so that doesn't discourage me because I know that's how this works. Amen. But at the same time, if you're not careful, it'll discourage you. It'll get to your mind. It'll play a mind game with you. And you can't let the mind game get the best of you because I'm not here to see who's here. I'm here to hear from God. And I'm here to whoever is here. I'm here to minister with them, to them, and get ministry from them. Amen? So you don't look at the numbers. You look at, listen, you look at the souls. That's right. Amen? And you can find out there's been some awesome, awesome times. You know, uh, we've had awesome times in the place packed. We've had awesome times in the place not so packed. But if you get your mind on that, then you lose out everything. And here it goes again, the size of the opponent. So that's the last thing. We're going we're to start now new. Ready? Here we go. First, he judged the outcome by the size of his opponent. Number two, he did not respect his opponent's weapon. The Bible said he saw he had five, he had, he had a, a sling and a stone, or five smooth stones. He had a, a, a little, little purse here that he carried his stones in. So when he saw the sling, he saw it as an insult. He, he, that sling looked primitive and it looked harmless. And Goliath had no respect for it. And that was his downfall. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever not pay attention to what Satan is bringing against you? You see, it'd be pretty easy to notice if an if a, if a F-18 flew in my yard and landed. It'd be pretty easy if a tank drove up and a Sherman tank drove up and parked on my front steps. That'd be pretty easy. I mean, think, all right, fellas, we're going to have a bad day. But you know what? That's not how he does it. He sends in the special forces. And the special forces mingles in with the crowd. And you have no idea that he's even sending in there, getting information back and forth, and passing back and forth very valuable information, and spreading things out, and spreading the stuff out like he wants it. So he sits there, and he takes you down, and you don't even pay attention to the opponent's weapon. Wow. It'd be nice if he did just announce, we're coming. That's not how it works. How many times have you said, I have no idea why they did that? Or how many times have you said, I would have never in a million years thought that that would have come from that person's mouth. I would have never in a million years thought that that would have happened over there. I would have never thought this or never thought that. He tries to get us not to respect the weapon. And so we got to pay attention, pay, pay careful attention. Matter of fact, uh, 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 watch this now. Here it is. David was a master with the sling. The Bible says that he, these guys, they were so good with their sling, they could split hairs at 100 feet. 
I mean, that's some bad news. Amen? So, 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 put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor. And part of it is to help with the salvation. You've got to be able to think because the enemy will come at your weapons. You have no idea what it is even bringing against you. And you've got to watch. You've got to understand and have respect for those weapons that he brings against you. Oh, watch this now. Let's just take this a little bit, a little bit deeper. Just a little bit deeper. 1 Corinthians 1 27, God had chosen, now this is us. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound those which are mighty. Foolish means to be absurd. Wise is practical. Weak is out of strength and feeble, and mighty is powerful. So he's chosen the absurd to, to confound the practical. He has chosen the the out of strength feeble to overcome and confound the powerful. For the weapons of our warfare are, uh, are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of our strongholds. So look, when you see him coming, you have respect for his weapons, and you also have to understand, you might not even understand this, but Satan has respect for your weapons. But he tries to tell you that he doesn't. That man tries to play a game with you. So here we go. Number two, he did not respect the opponent's weapon. Number three, this is a good one. Matter of fact, uh, sometimes we'll find our own self getting in this. He was overconfident. Because he said, look, ne never once uh, did it enter his mind that he was maybe going to lose. He said, am I a dog? Did you send a kid out here with a bunch of sticks? You see, for 40 days, they did nothing. And, and they thought nothing would change. He thought nothing would change. But Satan is propelled by pride. I want you to think about something. I want to read this to you. It's so awesome. Get ready. The Bible says in Isaiah 14. Let's see here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will send in the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to hell and to the sides of the pit. Here's what I think about whenever I'm fighting Satan. I remember this. When, he's getting, when I think he's getting bigger than I can handle. Here's what I think about. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the to tremble, that he did shape kingdoms? that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one of their own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, as the remnant of those that shall be slain, thrust through with the sword that go down to the sunstones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. There's going to come a day when you see him, and when you finally see him, you're going to go, really? This is who's been messing me up all these years? This is the one that's had me tore out of my friend? This is the one that tore up my family? This is the one that tore up on my job? This is the one that wanted to rule the world? This is the one that had it made in heaven and couldn't stand it. He had to be in charge and got kicked out of heaven. This is the one that one third of the angels in heaven followed. I can't believe they fell for it. How many times have we? Wow. How many times? Have we let him be big as Goliath? Not big as, listen, he's big as Goliath. Not thinking about how big our God is. All we can see is that Goliath standing in front of us and believe the lies. So, so, watch this. Satan knows he's defeated. Listen carefully. He knows he's defeated, so why does he keep coming? If he knows he's defeated, if he knows he's going to wind up in hell, if he knows that his end is coming near, why won't he quit? It's because his pride will not allow him to accept it. Mm. Satan's pride will not allow him to lay down. But he's going to keep on coming. So, so again, I'm going through kind of fast. 
So, so I hope y'all get. I hope you're catching all this. Get ready. Get ready. First Corinthians ten and twelve. Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. It is possible to come too confident in your strengths and neglect your weaknesses. Abraham was a man of faith, but he lost his courage going down to Egypt, and he wound up telling telling the Pharaoh that, that Sarah was his sister. Wow. And that's son. Would you like to know that you're? Would you like to be in a group with your wife and and say, "Yeah, he's my brother." I would not have it. Look, if I was somewhere and somebody comes and starts running their mouth and I said, yeah, that's my sister, Linda's my sister, I would have been better, more afraid of the people I told or Linda when I got home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, he was overconfident and then here, get ready, we're just about through. He left the place of vulnerability. <laughs> How many of you ever done that? God, you can have any chamber in my heart with this one. God, you can explore my mind. You can try my range, but just leave that little compartment right there alone. I got that one all to myself. I got it all figured out. You leave that one alone, God. God, I'm yours except for. God, God, I, God, I really want to do this, but you got to remember, God, there's that one little thing that you can't have because that's mine. And when I take care of it, I'll take care of it. Yeah, just leave it alone, God. And that's where Satan gets you. All right, just watch this now. Here, here it goes. Out of all his body, the only open place was a small opening in his head, over his head right here, where he could see. You see, Satan doesn't play fair. He will find the uncovered place in your own life and play on it until he brings you down. If it's pride, you'll hit it. If it's fear, he'll hit it. If it's some hang-up, he'll hit it. If it's a habit, he will hit it. Wherever it's at, he will take it and he will manipulate and he will play on your head because he knows that that open place is his doorway to get into your mind. So, so the place of vulnerability, maybe your finances, your desire, your pride, take no chances. Cover everything with the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, I'm just going to talk about this for just a minute and we're going to close. I want Brandon to do like he did last week. Brandon, I want you to get ready to come up in just a few minutes. I'll give you time to get up here. I've only got about 12 more slides. <laughs> I'm playing. <laughs> okay. Satan is a powerful foe, but he's still vulnerable. He's powerful. He can still get it done, but he's still, he's still vulnerable. 2 Corinthians 2 11 says, Satan should get advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices or his plans and his strategies. The beheader lost his head. You know why? His plans, his strategies were destroyed. And why were they destroyed? Watch this. Because he left the place open. I can't I just can't ask, I can't say it enough. What door are you? Leaving open. Yesterday, my father-in-law said, he said, he called me up and said, I got a leak. I'm, I'm leaking bad. Matter of fact, it was Friday night. He said, I'm leaking bad and, and, and I'm in my house and I just I can't get down there. He's 86. He said, I can't get down to work on it. So I got over there and I looked and I said, well, here's what you need. He said, well, here's what I've got. And, and so he wanted to replace the whole sink and all the stuff, the faucets. And I said, okay. And he said, well, let's just do it on Saturday. I said, that's fine because the back was hurting so bad. So we'll do it. And so, so we come back and on Saturday. I went over there and we went to Lowe's, got the stuff, and we come back and I replaced everything. I mean, everything, literally everything but, but the sink. And so I had to replace everything. I said, okay, now I'll cut it on. Cut the power on, cut the water on so I can see if I got any leaks or not. And you know, when you look at your water meter, if that little bit of rib. That little bit of red triangle. If it's moving, you've got a leak somewhere. He said, well, can, you, can you go out and turn it on? So I, got, I turn it on, and I come, and I see it. I see it going. I said, this ain't good. So I go look at my stuff, and I said, mine's sealed tight. There's not a leak, in, leak going on anywhere. And I turned on the water, and it was running kind of low. I said, this doesn't make sense. I know I don't have a leak. What's going on? He had decided to go throughout his house and turn on all the faucets. 
before I turned on the power or the water. And so I couldn't hear it. I didn't notice what was going on. I found one faucet in the bathroom. I turned that one off. I got that one turned off. So I said, what in the world is going on here? I said, I should have more power than this. I should have more water than this, more flow than this. And I shouldn't be getting the sign that I've got a leak somewhere. What is going on? And he said, he's got that big old deep Johnny Cash voice. And he said, well, I forgot to tell you, son, that I opened up a whole bunch of spirits. And I'm going to go turn them off and then you can check them. And so we went and still did some more. So we got to turn them all off. How do we got to turn it all off? The thing was fine. And then this scripture came right to me. This, this, this thing in a place of vulnerability. Some of us right now, we should have more flow going in our life. We should be having leaks in our life. But we're leaving some of our faucets open. And so God's trying to give us an overflow. But we can't get the overflow because we've got places where there's leaks. And if we can get past those leaks and let God use us, something very powerful would happen in our life. So, here we go. I'm going to get off that one. He risked his life on a lost cause. You see, Goliath was on the losing side anyway. Anytime somebody sets himself against God, God always wins. I've seen it time and time again. I've seen it at work. I've seen it in church. I've seen it in my life. When somebody comes up and tries to jump on it, and you can see when the Satan's handy work, you watch. It's not going to last. It's going to go down. Amen? It will go down. Revelation 23 says he's going to spend 1,000 years in the bottomless pit. And when he's released... The crazy rascal still attacks again. Somebody says, well, why is he in there for a thousand years? Let me just kind of try to explain this a few weeks ago, then months ago. I don't exactly when. <coughs> but I want to make sure there's not a misunderstanding. If somebody dies today in Christ, they're born again. They know Jesus. If they die today, they're going to go to heaven and they never have to ever worry about whether I'm going to, if salvation is going to last on the other side. Forever you're going to be with God. Forever. <coughs> but when the rapture takes place and the church is taken up and the people that are taken up, the ones that are taken up never have to worry about hell. They never have to worry about any of that. They're going to be fine. But the ones left behind that go through tribulation, they're the ones that's going to have the problem. They've got to, got to make it through the tribulation. But during the tribulation, there's still going to be children being born. The life's still going to be going on. When you get in the millennial reign, Jesus is going to set up a millennial reign to show you how the earth's supposed to run without sin, without temptation, without any problems. He's going to show how it's supposed to run. But during that time, there's going to be those that are mortal, that made it through the tribulation, they're going to be in the millennial reign. We're going to be there as kings and priests. We're going to rule because we're going to come back with Jesus and we're going to rule. But, but for that thousand years, it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. Now, now, Satan, when he's released, the rascal goes right back and tries, he tempts the world again and there's going to be people that never, you got this has got to happen because it wouldn't be fair to be born in paradise and never have to face sin. Because all of us have. So the people in the millennial are going to have to face that too. They're not going to be dying, they're not going to be death. But when they get in the millennial, here's what's going to happen. Satan's going to come by and he's going to tempt. And when he tempts, he's going to draw up armies. And he's going to try to fight, fight Jesus. You know, but you know, I, I, I like this. The Bible says, I love this. Then shall the wicked be revealed, then the Lord, with whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. This is when he throws him in the bottom's pit, of course. But look, all Jesus has to do to defeat Satan is show up. He doesn't have to raise a hand. All he's got to do is show up. So why am I fighting him so hard? If all I got to do is trust a man that all he's got to do is show up and things change. How many times have you been wrestling all night long with a problem or wrestling with something going on or wrestling with fear or wrestling with hope or a lack of hope 
or wrestling with, with, with misunderstandings or wrestling with sadness or wrestling when your heart's just been torn all to pieces. You're wrestling this stuff and Jesus just shows up and things change. Wow. So now, watch this. Finally, don't lose your head. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I love it. Don't lose your head. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I will give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Be not anxious about anything. Now you come up, Randy. Be not anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace, watch this. That word for peace means to put together again. That word for anxious means to tear apart. Everything Satan does, he tries to tear apart your heart, tear apart your thinking, tear apart your mind, tear apart your, your, your life in Christ. And it brings anxiety. Tears apart. But when God's peace comes, He puts it back together. There's things in our life that are trying to tear us apart. essay this week and at the end I had to put down my hero one of my heroes of faith for my hero of faith I put down my daughter my hero of faith I said because I'm walking with her through this and I see the stuff every day and it gets worse and now my lymphedema has gotten out of control and, uh, I said, I have yet to hear her complain. And only a couple of times she told me she was afraid. This morning I looked at her and I was already bandaged her up and I was putting, I was putting on the lymphedema neoprene sleeve. It's so hard to put on. And she was, ugh, she was, a tear was coming out of her eye. And I sprayed her arm with silicone and still was having a hard time getting up because her arm was so swollen. And I looked at her and she didn't know I'd been writing about her all week. And so while she was hurting and while I saw a little tear in her eye, not complaining, just that little tear. And I was pushing, I said, you got to grab me. And I had to push against his arm. The lady tried to show us how to do it. She had to wear special gloves and she couldn't even get it on. And so I'm pulling, I'm yanking. I know Linda couldn't do it. I know Beth can't do it on her own. I'm trying really hard. I looked at her and I said, you know, I wrote a paper about you. And she said, you did that? I said, yeah. I said, you were my hero of faith. And she smiled. And I said, you're the only person I know that had this attitude that you've got. I'm so proud of you. Your attitude and your actions. I am so proud of you. And you lift me up so much. And I said, at the same time, I've never seen a person that had this much faith and still made the punk to us. And she laughed. I said, matter of fact, I think you made it get a punchy man he wanted to shoot a couple of cardinals and she laughed and she said dad I know I said yeah I know I said but we're going to get this thing and we're going to whip it together she says yes dad we're going to do this thing and I walked out of the house I got bumped her I gave her a fist bump I said you remember you're my hero of faith I said matter of fact in God's Hebrews chapter 11 you're written in it God doesn't want us to apart. God wants us put together. Put together. No matter how bad the situation is, put together. That's all stand.
Every head bowed, every eye closed. Satan wants so bad to get to us. He wants to just drive us crazy. He wants to cause us to be anxious, to pull our nerves apart, to pull our hearts apart, to pull our, 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 our very being apart so that we cannot think and we cannot be functional in our own life, much less be functional in our spiritual life. He doesn't want us holding on to God. He wants us holding on to ourselves. Knowing that we have not what we need, we have to hold on to God for this. Goliath did those five things that brought him down. We can do the same thing if we're not careful. My challenge to you today is to trust God every ounce of strength that you have. Trust God with all that you've got because God's got this. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed. How many would raise that hand and hope before you do it? raise that hand quickly and say, you know, Pastor, I, I, I find myself doing the same thing, and it's getting the best of me, and I didn't realize, but now I know, and I cannot let this tear me apart. Instead, I've got to stand strong and believe God is going to get me through whatever this is that's getting me down. How many of you just say, pray for me, Pastor? Put your hand up and right back down. There you go. There you go. God, touch them right now. Minister to them mightily in the name of Jesus. And I feel your power and I feel your anointing. You've got this. You've got this, God. You've got this, and we trust you. Now, we're going to open these altars up. You can come and pray for anything you've got. You can come and pray. If you just want to come and talk to the Lord about things in your life, whatever, you just want to praise Him, the altars are open. Come. Come to the altar. Talk to the Lord. God's awesome. God's awesome. God's awesome. God's awesome. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for the peace that comes, knowing that we are your children and that you're going to take care of business. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. God, we cannot do without you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tuesday nights, we're doing something awesome. Discerning the will of God. Come on, check it out. Plus, you can put some meat on your bones and read it too. And I just see, I saw Sister, Sister Brenda, please forgive me. I should have had you up here playing too, but I, I didn't see you. I, didn't, I got to get glasses, y'all. I didn't see Sister Brenda. Please forgive me. Amen. So if y'all looking out there to you right there and you think he's looking at me funny, I might not even see you. <laughs> Amen. God's awesome. Tuesday night's going to be awesome. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. I'm going to ask the elder brother Baker, the statesman, to dismiss us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today, Lord. We thank you for the awesome message that the man of God brought. And I pray, Lord, that you receive it and use it, Lord, for your work here in this everyday life that we walk. And I pray, Lord, I thank you for each and every one that's done today, Lord, that have received this word and be able to share it with someone that you put before them this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.